Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the presentation today. Is everything good on your end? You see everything? All right. Yeah, everything is fine. Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's a true honor to be able to have this opportunity to uh, present and, and talk to you all about some research that we conducted in, in Lubbock, Texas. I'm an I'm a assistant professor at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, so we, we live in an environment with uh, really high ET rates, uh, fairly limited amounts of rainfall. Um, I think our, our climate conditions are, are classified as semi-arid. Uh, which I believe is is fairly comparable to some of the uh, locations in Spain and of course numerous uh, locations around the world. So we have somewhat of similar challenges uh, as we talked about uh, providing this presentation today. Uh, this is just some research and topics that we've looked at in the past. So as I work through the presentation today one thing i would ask is that if you have any questions feel free to include the, include those type those into the chat box and i'll i'll make sure that those get answered uh, during the presentation uh, we'll also have time at the end to uh, take any further questions and, and discuss any items in more detail but uh, my primary goals for today's presentation are going to be to introduce you all to some different water resources and, and maybe definitions for different water resources. Uh, we'll talk about the four major challenges, especially chemical challenges, that we see uh, when we're incorporating alternative or non-potable water resources. We'll talk about how to overcome some of those uh, plant and soil challenges that we would expect to see when we're using non-potable water. And then the last portion of the presentation will be a discussion of some research that we conducted here at Texas Tech in Lubbock, uh, looking at uh, how to overcome water quality issues, especially with high salinity, which tends to be our biggest issue in the part of Texas that I live in. So uh, one thing that I believe all of you should have access to these different papers, uh, the couple of papers that are linked here in this slide uh, are in the handouts that you were provided uh, as you signed in for the class today. In addition to those two uh, manuscripts or journal articles that I've provided, uh, also get a decent amount of information in this talk from a textbook uh, titled Turfgrass landscape irrigation water quality. You can see kind of the front of that textbook uh, in the PowerPoint slides that are provided as well. Um, so again, this is a really great resource uh, to help me with some of the terminology and helps me really kind of learn basic concepts of water quality that were important in, for us as we were working through our uh, research project and learning a little bit more about some uh, different aspects. So I want to start off by just kind of uh, explaining some different terms and defining some terms, maybe that at least in the United States, I know that these terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but there may be limited knowledge with regards to uh, the actual definition of these terms. The first of those is wastewater. Wastewater is actually untreated water. So uh, water that maybe comes from uh, residential or commercial operations within the United States that may not be treated in any kind of form would be defined as wastewater. A uh, broader term uh, that we would sometimes see used in a lot of cases is the word reclaimed water. And so reclaimed water is uh, a little different in the fact that it's treated to some extent, and we'll talk about some of those different treatments on a slide upcoming here, um, but it's not treated to the level to be deemed potable or drinkable water. Okay, so it's treated, but not treated to that same level. And this reclaimed water category that's treated 
uh, can include a number of different terms to describe that water, which would include affluent water, reclaimed water, or treated wastewater. So those are other terms, at least in the United States, that you would hear uh, when hearing a definition for the reclaimed water. Another term that we might hear uh, as well is recycled water. And so uh, I, I believe from my understanding, at least in the uh, area of Spain and, and probably other areas around the world, as we uh, look and we, we realize, recognize that our potable water sources are being depleted at a rapid rate to where we have minimal amounts of that potable drinkable water, uh, it really increases the importance that we maybe have some alternative water sources, especially for areas like turf grass management, where we have plants that are capable of still doing very well. Uh, they're, they're not generally uh, going to be susceptible to many challenges when we utilize these water sources. So it just adds to our availability to water. Uh, however, we understand and we know that the water quality that we're receiving with these recycled or reclaimed waters is going to generally be much less uh, lower quality than what we would anticipate getting with drinking water. So in addition to those things, at least again, uh, more so maybe some terms we use in the United States a little bit more, should also be relevant to other portions of the world, uh, would be the second term storm water reuse, uh, which is just uh, storm water that kind of moves into different places. Our golf courses here uh, in the United States, and I'm sure in your area too, may utilize that as, as one of the major sources of irrigation. I know we have a golf course here in Lubbock that uses that water. And I'll show you a slide a little bit later on from some work that we conducted early in my time here at Lubbock, probably about four or five years ago where we actually looked at water quality reports from different golf courses that had different water resources and that storm water was the cleanest, freshest you know, water uh, when we looked at the chemical tests for those water resources. And then lastly, water harvesting, which is probably a little bit more on an individualistic kind of scale, smaller scale. We have any landscape managers uh, in attendance today or if you, no, any other landscape managers. Rainwater harvesting is uh, is a major way that we can uh, collect rainwater, especially in these semi-arid environments. Uh, I know for us, uh, we get about 20 inches of rain per year, uh, which would be consistent with, um, I believe that's probably around about 50 centimeters of rain per year. And so you don't really think that's very much until you start thinking about what you can capture from a, a surface like a roof. And when you start thinking about that, it adds up very quickly and we can go a long ways with some different rainwater that we might harvest. This is a, a, an image that I, that I found online and I really liked. I apologize that this is uh, all in English and this, this wasn't probably translatable to Spanish. Um, so I'll kind of work my way through this. Hopefully everybody can grasp uh, what's going on here. But this looks really at the, the treatment process, how that water gets cleaned uh, before maybe it's accessible. So that first category of water uh, that we learned about from that first definition was just untreated wastewater, not treated in any kind of way. And that generally is coming from our, our homes or commercial buildings. It may be from the restroom, the kitchen, the laundry, or other commercial uh, areas. And so uh, generally speaking, this is mostly water. Uh, it's not gonna have a whole lot of contaminants in it, but there are definitely some contaminants in there that we might would like to get rid of before we started to utilize it on a, a golf course setting or in an irrigation setting. So that kind of leads us to some of our treatment levels. The first is called primary treatment. This takes out the bigger, biggest pieces of solid material. A lot of times this is conducted in a sedimentation tank where water is basically just sitting still. Uh, the solid particles heavier sink to the bottom 
water is taken out and that's removing some of the particles from the water. Secondary treatment here uh, starts to look into some maybe finer uh, removal of solid material, maybe through some filtration type systems or uh, different ways to minimize some of the contributing factors that may be negative in that water resource. And then the last one I want to talk about here is tertiary. Uh, it's kind of a third level of cleaning. Uh, this, this is going to use maybe a sand filter to take out some different particles to clean that water a little bit more effectively. Um, one of the papers that I included as a handout was a, a, a water quality paper actually from uh, Madrid, Spain. And this, the paper that I included is a little bit more geared towards urban parks. And it doesn't talk about turf grass in that paper, but it does talk about the effects of treated wastewater on some different urban landscape plants, different trees that you may have common in your area. And in that paper, it identified the level of treated wastewater at this tertiary treatment. So you can imagine that that may be a level that's consistent with a lot of the water that you may receive. Another level of cleaning would be disinfection. Uh, this is generally going to be the use of chlorination or uh, violet light that's going to take out mostly human pathogens. Okay, so the bigger concern here is human pathogens that can be problematic to humans that may come in contact with that water. It's not a concern really for plant pathogens. So we're not going to anticipate much of those really being affected by this disinfection process. But you can see that generally speaking, our secondary treatment water is, is primarily just available for irrigation purposes. But that tertiary water, a little bit cleaner, uh, can be used for some different commercial uses, indus industrial uses, uh, maybe even uh, use in toilets as, as water to run toilets or irrigation. So you can imagine, again, the level of cleaning is a little bit higher. So hopefully, uh, working through that and, and describing those different steps helps to build a little bit of understanding of the cleaning process that the water would go through, even that when we call it treated or reclaimed water that is treated in some, uh, to some extent. Now, there are four major challenges that we will see from a chemical standpoint when we're using non-potable or alternative water sources. One is salt content, and we're going to describe each of these in more detail, talk about them in more detail as we move on here. But we have salt content, we have a sodium permeability hazard or a sodium content, uh, the third is nutrient imbalances. So a lot of times we want to keep in mind that these treated waters are going to come with a higher amount of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus specifically. And so the higher, higher nutrient content just needs to be accounted for as we're thinking about fertility plans and how much nutrients we need to put on turf grass, on golf courses, athletic fields, or, or home lawns. And then the last one is going to be specific ion toxicities, uh, mostly uh, surrounding sodium, chlorine, chlorine, and boron, those being three of the primary uh, nutrients that are going to lead to uh, leaf-specific toxins on a plant. So let's start with that first one. Let's talk about uh, challenges and maybe ways that we combat or the plant combats high salt content. So uh, first, it's really important to understand that as we uh, dissolve more items into water, uh, nutrients and elements into that water, uh, cations and anions, uh, this increases the salt content, but it also uh, decreases water potential. So we all know that water potential is basically a soil physics term that we might use that helps us to understand how water is going to move when we think about water moving from the soil into the plant, through the plant, and up into the atmosphere. It's always moving to a more negative water potential. Uh, so the aspect that makes water potential negative, one of those aspects at least, is the osmotic pressure. 
Okay, and so as we mix more solutes into water in the soil from high salt contents, the water potential starts to go down. It becomes more negative and it can be difficult for the plant to be able to extract that water and out of the soil and get it into the plant. So uh, this really requires that a plant uh, undergo or be able to osmotically adjust. So if, if the plant can adjust its water potential internally by adding more solutes to its cells, then that cell would be able to maintain normal water pressure Turger pressures, the more scientific term there. And this little image that you see from Oklahoma State in the bottom right of the slide is an indicator of a plant cell that's full of water versus one that's losing water or not able to take up water uh, due to a limited ability to osmotically adjust. If a plant is growing under conditions of high salt content in the soil, um, that plant is probably going to experience symptoms similar to drought stress. So if you see drought stress on turf grass, we anticipate maybe a little bit going off color, starting with chlorosis, uh, yellowing and turning into necrosis or browning. Uh, so you're gonna see a similar progression if a turf grass is unable to osmotically adjust, it's unable to take up water, then you're gonna see similar symptoms to drought stress. That's gonna be a lack of photosynthesis, just a lack of overall growth due to that inability to take up water from the soil. So this table uh, is directly from the textbook that I had mentioned on that second slide. And it describes and lists out a number of different turf grasses that we use uh, in cosmetic situations like uh, like golf courses, athletic fields, and then some native grasses to the United States, at least, that we may see. And it breaks these down or divides these into categories of uh, superior salt tolerance, very tolerant, tolerant, uh, and then sensitive uh, turf grass species. So you can see our, our most tolerant so salinity tolerant turf grasses are going to be seashore past pallum. Uh, it's on a warm season grass capable of growing in warmer climates and it does exceptionally well under really really poor water quality. So uh, when we have a turf grass that's capable of surviving those salt conditions more effectively there's going to be a reduction in the need for some of the management practices that we will discuss uh, to reduce that salinity level in the soil. So that's kind of the benefit when we're looking at these options for uh, either superior tolerance or very tolerant turf grasses. You can see that most of these are warm season grasses. The alkali grass here that is also has a superior tolerance does not form a very uh, dense turf grass canopy. It does not form a very high quality turf grass. It's generally not something that we're going to see as an amenity grass, even though it does have a uh, really, really high salt tolerance. Okay, so the second chemical concern that we have when we're dealing with water quality and lower water quality is the idea of a sodium permeability hazard. Okay, so as, as we think about this, this uh, whereas salinity is a plant response in a lot of cases, the, the response is from the plant with the drought stress-like symptoms, uh, this is gonna be much more of a uh, soil-related problem. So as we start to get increased levels of sodium in the soil, what we may see is we, we may see a uh, loss of structure. This is most consistent uh, whenever we're working with soils that have a very high clay content or very high organic matter content. Our turf grasses are very capable of storing high levels of organic matter, especially if we have limited amounts of cultivation practices being implemented in our different areas that we're trying to manage. So we can see this as being a big issue when sodium permeability hazard is, is a concern. Um, if we do have issues with sodium, some effects that we may see from that is lack of water infiltration. Uh, basically, you get kind of a, a ceiling or a, a limited ability of water to penetrate the soil surface. And so if you get water 
puddling or pooling at the surface, that could be an indication that we have some problems. Uh, aerification and, and lack of oxygen in that root zone is going to be uh, one of our biggest concerns when we have issues with sodium permeability hazard. Uh, Joseph? Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, two questions. Okay. Okay. The first one is when the when the suppliers talk about more salt tolerant varieties. Okay. What are the what <clears throat> what are they talking about? Uh, do these differences come from genetics or from physiologic pathways? We uh, that that's an excellent question. I would say it could be a little bit of both. The the table that I presented here uh, would would be based on. Um, uh, just basic differences in our turf grass species. The capability of those grasses to withstand salt in that case is, is variation based on species. However, uh, when we start getting within a given species, we can still see uh, a lot of variability in increased or decreased salt tolerance in a, in a, from a cultivar or variety standpoint. And so in, in that case, then I would say there's a good chance that uh, we may be looking at improved salt tolerance based on breeding efforts or genetics. Okay, great. And the other question is that uh, he, he, he's asking about the, the water test results that you presented uh, maybe two slides before. That okay. uh, he couldn't see uh, results about uh, sulfates. Okay. Um, I think, and I don't know that I've gotten to any of the uh, specific information yet where we're showing water test reports in our presentation, but they're coming up um, ah, okay. in in a in a in a short while. So. So we may hang on just a second. If that doesn't so, get answered, then we can come back to it. Let, let's do let's do one thing. Maybe if uh, Joseph, if if he can, maybe he can explain better what he means of, with the sure. question. Then we'll do it later. Okay, that sounds good okay. to me. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so we're gonna pick up here uh, with our third challenge that we have chemically uh, when we're using these uh, low quality uh, water resources. And so in this case, we're talking about nutrient imbalances. So I kind of have the question here, is this good or is this bad? It can be either. Uh, it can be either good or bad. From a good standpoint, uh, we're basically getting free application of nutrition. So maybe there's a limited or less fertility applications that are needed in the case that we understand how much nutrients, especially nitrates, are in that water resource or uh, phosphorus as well. So the fact that we can add those things is very beneficial. Uh, I was also just recently reading a paper uh, regarding water quality and soil health. And there was a indication from a paper that as we apply some of these treated wastewaters that have higher nutrition, that spurs or increases the level of microbial uh, activity in the soil and we know that could be beneficial from a soil health standpoint so those are benefits now on a on a bad side you know if we think about irrigation that may run off of our property uh, irrigation that we may apply to our golf course that may ultimately get into another waterway that can be bad in the sense that we may be increasing pollution especially with those nutrients very concerning uh, for water quality related issues, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Those can lead to algae production in some of our water resources, which is not only unsightly, uh, but it can be very damaging to uh, organisms that are living in water uh, when eutrophication occurs, that lack of oxygen, uh, depletion of oxygen through the, the death and, and degradation of those plant materials that are building up over time. So again, this can be good or bad. Just key thing here is to account for the nutrients that are being applied with irrigation in that case. The fourth and, and final uh, issue that we have from a chemical standpoint are specific ion toxicities. OK, 
Okay, and so we're really looking at three different nutrients that are problematic. Okay, so that's sodium, chlorine, and boron, those three different uh, elements. Uh, for the sodium and the chlorine, uh, that's where we're going to have the biggest potential to see uh, direct problems, especially on the leaf or the foliar portion of the plant. Uh, whereas, uh, let's see here, uh, the bicarbonates and the irons can leave unsightly deposits, kind of discolored deposits on some of our hard surfaces. Maybe it's cart pass, maybe it's sidewalks and various things like that. Um, one thing I would mention here is I would say that the opportunity to see uh, foliar decline due to these nutrients on a turf grass, I would say it's fairly limited uh, just because of structure of the grass, uh, the way that we irrigate it, different things like that. In the picture that you can see that I included on this slide, uh, you see a kind of burning and necrosis on an ornamental plant. And I think this is probably where we're gonna see the biggest issue is when we get overspray or misted spray onto different ornamental plants as we're irrigating, then I think we can see some of these foliar issues, especially with sodium and chlorine toxicity in that foliar portion of the plant. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Does, yes. Another question, please. Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, may sodium modify soil soil structure on a sandy soil? That's a great question. Uh, it more than likely, I would say no. Uh, I think the issue that we can run into when we get really high sand content soils is that if we have a lot of organic matter, we could get kind of separation of those organic. Uh, particles in the soil, which could leave them closer to the surface and create some sealing or, or that lack of ability for water to penetrate the soil. When we think about sands, generally speaking, those each individual sand grain is a is is the structure of that sand. So whereas clays are are very dynamic in their structure, they can be broken apart. And, and lose structure more easily than what we see with sands. So that would actually be a really good way to overcome uh, some of the water quality issues that we may see in turf grass situations is to have a, a sand-based root zone. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, just a question because there is another another one. Okay. Uh, does the storage of the reclaimed water tends to create an, an, an unbalanced nutrient income? So the question there is asking whether storage maybe on site or at the facility starts to create greater imbalance in nutrients? Does the storage of the rain water tends to create unbalanced nutrient income? Uh, maybe the question is, is, is the one get, yes, he, he says that okay. yes. That what okay. You okay. So uh, I I am not one hundred percent sure about the 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 best way to answer that particular question. Uh, I I would say that in some cases uh, allowing water to sit in an area could be beneficial with regards to uh, improving some of the quality aspects. <laughs> Uh, I would think about some of those salt, some of the elements may come together to create salts that uh, maybe precipitate out of the water, especially if they're just uh, sitting idle uh, for a period of time. So uh, there's part of me that thinks that that may be beneficial in maybe reducing a little bit of that nutrient uh, input that we would see uh, in from just sitting in a sedimentation type tank. Okay, thanks. All right, so um, let's see. I think we'll just go on and move on to the next slide and talk a little bit here uh, about really kind of assessing the overall water quality. And this might get back to that second question that we kind of uh, were maybe alluding to a little bit earlier in the presentation. Uh, in this case, uh, this first slide, again, is from that textbook that I had mentioned on the second slide. And it talks about 
uh, ways that you can kind of look at a water quality test report uh, to look for some uh, consistencies and, and some things that you would anticipate to see uh, from an accurate, uh, well-conducted water test report, uh, which includes that there's a, normally a few different ways that labs can can measure some of these different ions that are in the water. And so uh, the recommendation here is that the, the sum of the cations or the positively charged ions in that water should be pretty similar to the anions, the negatively charged uh, ions within that water. Uh, one other issue that we can run into from time to time, especially looking at water and soil test reports for that matter, is that different labs may report the the level of an ion or a nutrient in some different units. And so being able to convert to comparable units, in the case of what we're talking about here, uh, we really want to be in this uh, mill equivalence per liter. So if you get data in another format, you know, maybe look to try to get those uh, numbers converted to mill equivalents per liter. And then another caveat here that can be beneficial is to understand that generally speaking, the EC, the electrical conductivity or total salt content measured as decisimens per meter should be approximately uh, one tenth of the cations and the anions that we would see in that water resource. So uh, this is a, an example, uh, just an example test. Uh, this is directly from that textbook that I uh, mentioned earlier in the uh, in the in the process here. Uh, so we have a couple of different laboratory samples that were uh, sent in. You can see the measurement for pH EC here uh, is is 0.34. Uh, measuring at 0.34, which is approximately one-tenth of the sum of the cations and the anions. So uh, if we were utilizing that idea from the previous slide, we might identify this second test as, as maybe being conducted in a slightly different way. Uh, not to say that it's not completely accurate, and it's completely inaccurate, but uh, the testing mechanism was conducted in a in a way to where those things that we anticipate to hold true aren't necessarily holding true uh, when we look at the lab number two results. So we wanna see something a little bit more like lab number one here, where we get fairly equal cations, anions, and about one-tenth that EC level uh, with those different anions and cations. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the question that we were talking yeah. before that it was it was not uh, completely clear. Uh, let me read it for you. The, um, uh, the question is the imbalance between anions and cations is usually in favor of the anions. Is it good management to apply cations like potassium, calcium, or magnesium? Is as far as an application to help offset some of those anions, is that what the question is is related to? Uh, sorry. Is uh, is the question in relation to it maybe uh, applying or, or adding those cations to the water resource or to the soil? I I understand to the to the soil. Okay, so I would agree, and, and that's something that as we, again, as we move through the presentation, we're gonna talk about those a little bit more, we'll talk about gypsum applications, uh, which is a calcium, magnesium, and, and sulfate-based product that's gonna increase uh, some of those cations in the soil. So that is a mechanism, yes, that we can use to overcome some of our poor water quality related issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are gonna move on here. This is uh, this is this is a table that was developed from work that we did here in Lubbock uh, again about probably four or five years ago, published in 2015, and I believe again this this is another one of the papers that uh, that you would have access to in your handout. Uh, but I thought one thing that was interesting here was was comparison of uh, well water, which is uh, groundwater for us coming out of uh, an aquifer. Uh, a retention pond was where we get some of that surface 
water, maybe the storm water runoff that we talked about earlier as a cleaner resource in a lot of cases, and then recycled water. We only have one course that had recycled water, so we didn't get kind of a range of things here. But I think it's interesting to look at, you know, some of those concerning aspects. We look at EC, uh, we look, this is in measured in decisimens per meter. Uh, you can see we get a pretty wide range, uh, maybe a little bit lower in that retention pond uh, than, than maybe what we're gonna see in recycled water. That's ex expected, I think, in a lot of cases. Um, pH, uh, a little bit more, you know, wide ranging here, maybe a little more acidic for that recycled water. And that can be different in different locations. Uh, the other paper I have with regards to urban parks that I applied or uh, is included in your handouts, uh, you would see that the water pH uh, for all of those are really about the same for drinking water and uh, the reclaimed or recycled water used in those urban parks. So all of these things may be a little bit different in different situations, uh, but this is just a good example of maybe variation uh, that you may see uh, as we look at different water resources. And I think this would be consistent with variation that we would see uh, around the world, really and truthfully, as we look at different water resources. Okay, so at this point, uh, we've kind of talked about a number of different aspects related to water testing. And so I wanted to just kind of briefly introduce some different ideas about how we go about uh, managing turf grass areas more effectively whenever we are utilizing some of these lower quality water resources. So uh, I think one of the first and, and biggest things that we see as a recommendation is to apply leaching fractions of water to help really move water uh, down through a, a soil profile. Um, you know, in, in this case, uh, in especially a place like Lubbock, Texas, and in the semi-arid environments of Spain and other places around the world, uh, what you anticipate seeing is you see relatively limited rainfall as opposed to uh, evaporative demand or ET demand, okay? And so as we get a uh, really high ET demand and we're applying a low quality, high salt content water, we apply the water, salt's included in that water, water's gonna evaporate through either transpiration or evaporation, but the salts are staying behind. And so as we continue to add water to that turf grass system, we get more evaporation without rainfall. The salt level starts to accumulate uh, to the point where we may see injury on grasses like Bermuda grass that we may identify as highly tolerant to different salt levels. So that leads to our primary mechanism of reducing salts in the soil to be applied additional irrigation water to push or move salts down deeper into that soil profile below the root system. As long as we can get the salts down below that root system, then you know we're good to go. Now, uh, a place like Lubbock, we often or frequently get maybe a one inch rainfall. And that's probably the best way for us to really leach salts and different things that are building up in our soil profile in that root zone. Uh, but if we're in a, a situation where we're not getting rainfall, applying this leaching fraction can, again, push those salts deeper down into the soil that are building up. Now, we're only going to be, or we can only get as clean as the water source that we're providing and we're, we're using in our situation. So without rainfall, we can't anticipate the, the soil to be any cleaner than the water resource that we're using. And I think that's one important caveat uh, to keep in mind. Uh, now the challenge here is that we're really talking about applying more water. And so I'm gonna come back to this idea as I talk about the research project that we conducted here in Lubbock, but uh, this, you know, it's a great idea. It's probably the best way for us to move salts, but it means that we're applying more water. And in a place like Lubbock, there is, 
uh, minimal amounts of water to go around. And if we're applying more water, then that's kind of going against the idea of conserving water that we typically want to do uh, in areas that we're trying to manage turf grass. It's one of the ways that we can try to conserve water and still try to maintain a healthy turf grass is the use of wetting agents. Uh, in this case, uh, this is some work that was conducted at Texas A&M. It's uh, more Southern Texas. They have a uh, much higher prevalence of sodium in their water. They have uh, more high clay content soils than, than we tend to have up in the Northern part of Texas. And so they end up using a lot of sand capping, which might go back again to one of those first questions about the idea of uh, sand particles and their soil structure and the potential to lose that structure. And we minimize that by sand capping. And we also increase the amount of drainage that we can get. But wetting agents can play a really big role too in the movement of water down through a soil profile with the idea of hopefully being able to take salts further down with it as well and reduce the amount of salt that would accumulate in the surface area where our roots are effectively growing. Uh, this next slide here uh, really talks about gypsum applications and this may be a little more geared towards that uh, the last question that we talked about. Uh, again, I want to, this is a little bit more geared towards sodium permeability hazard. So when we get high sodium levels that are concerning, this is where gypsum plays a really big role in helping us to alleviate issues with soil structure loss. Okay, and that's what gypsum is really designed to do. Uh, we can see here that uh, gypsum is basically a, a a calcium sulfate uh, type product. So it gives us a couple of benefits in that we're adding some uh, calcium. Think about calcium as kind of a building block to soil structure. It really helps to, to create soil structure. And then the sulfates are really useful for helping to lower soil pH over the course of time. And all of these different aspects, adding these cations, like was asked in the question, really helps to flocculate or join soil particles together. Whereas sodium, high sodium content in the soil uh, really drives that degradation of soil structure. It, it takes soil particles, soil structure, and it breaks them apart into which they're in little smaller pieces. They compress together with watering and traffic. And that's what ends up ultimately limiting the ability of water to infiltrate it reduces pore space, it reduces our ability to grow healthy and effective turf grasses in those locations where we're using water qualities, especially those that have sodium permeability hazard concerns. One of the uh, other uh, real practical ways that we can really help to uh, limit some of the issues that we see with high salt and especially sodium content is effective consistent aerification okay when i'm talking it can be solid tine aerification it can be hollow tine aerification uh, the deeper into the soil profile we can get the better off we're going to be because we can create channels for water movement we can create channels for root growth we've all seen images like the one here where you get an aerification hole and you can see there's a massive amount of root production uh, in that aerification hole after top dressing. So water movement's increased, uh, oxygen is increased, increased root growth, all these things are really beneficial to help that plant to overcome some of the challenges that it's going to be experiencing if we're using a lower quality water. Uh, hi Joseph, uh, yes. some questions there? Yes, sure, oh, go ahead. Uh, okay, the first one. Uh, how long is it advisable to wait between the application of gypsum and and the uh, leaching? Okay, uh, I would say for that question regarding timing of application, uh, you know, I, I think you would probably, I, I, the, the label of the product that you're using is gonna be your, your first go-to. So as far as application timing, uh, in the work that we did, we looked at a monthly application 
and then I would say maybe get that product watered in and then maybe four to seven days after being watered in, letting it kind of incorporate, uh, let some of that calcium be attached to uh, those soil colloids and, and particles in the soil, and then maybe get a nice flushing uh, irrigation event, maybe again about four to seven days later, uh, try to really push that uh, salt down through the soil a little deeper. Okay, <clears throat> another one. Uh, does it make sense to apply gypsum in a sand-based root zone fairway? Uh, there may be some benefit, but uh, I think, and again, this is will probably stand out to everyone uh, whenever I work walk through uh, some of the things that we saw from our research. Um, but I would say the biggest benefit for gypsum is to overcome sodium permeability hazard. And if you think back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, our biggest concerns with sodium permeability hazard are high clay content soils and also high organic matter content soils. So because we don't have much potential to lose structure in those high sand content soils, my thought is that you may not see the benefit from that perspective. Um, one thing that you may see a benefit from may be a reduction in soil pH. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we will move on then to the last section of our presentation today, uh, where we're going to talk a little bit about some practical aspects. And, and this is research that I conducted with a, a graduate student uh, in our department. Uh, it was funded by the United States Golf Association, as well as the Golf Course Superintendents Association. And I want to just introduce the product project to you all and talk a little bit about some of the results. Uh, you also received a handout of our uh, agronomy journal paper that was published uh, earlier this year in which it kind of describes some of the results in more detail. Uh, if any of you have access to uh, Golf Course Management Magazine, I believe we also uh, recently this year uh, published an article in Golf Course Management, uh, kind of a US English version there uh, to go along with the scientific version that you have attached with your handouts. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry yes. Joseph, uh, uh, before just moving forward, uh, there are uh, two questions about okay. uh, gypsum. So, if you, okay. if you, okay, you agree? Yeah. Uh, sure. uh, besides working with uh, gypsum applications and fairways, have you ever worked with elemental sulfur? In uh, uh, this, yeah, so in this particular uh, project, and in the work that I have done, we have not worked directly with elemental sulfur. Uh, in some of uh, previous research, I was kind of more so associated with uh, looking at spring dead spot control or management in Bermuda grass, uh, which is, of course is a turf grass disease that we see in areas where we experience enough cold weather to force that Bermuda grass into dormancy. Uh, we get some root infecting pathogens that uh, infect the grass in the fall. We see lack of green up in the spring, basically. Uh, there was a colleague at Mississippi State I worked with, and he was working with spring dead spot in which we applied elemental sulfur to the, the turf grass area to lower soil pH, try to manage or limit some of the activity of that fungus. Uh, so that's about my experience of working with elemental sulfur. Uh, you know, again, the benefit there is just a reduction in pH. Uh, I, I don't know that we would anticipate seeing any effects with regards to uh, salt movement uh, with that product compared to what we see with gypsum. Uh, the main thing with the gypsum is having that calcium present to dissociate, take off and remove the sodium and replace it with the calcium. And we would not get that if we were applying something like elemental sulfur, but we may see a reduction in soil pH. So if you're looking to reduce soil pH, that's a good option. 
Okay, uh, another question from a guy, a guy from Argentina that is managing sports fields. Okay. He, he says that he's working on a sport field with uh, salty soils. Okay. He's asking about the best way to apply gypsum. Maybe you are going to ask this question talking about your research in the next slides. I don't know. And the, next, and the other question is that uh, if you apply gypsum on dormant Bermuda grass, uh, is, it ne is it necessary to water after the application or not? Because the... uh, Okay, so uh, I would always, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a number of different gypsum uh, related products. Um, and so, mm -hmm. One thing I would say is to definitely read the label of the products that you have, because there's probably going to be indications of how to most effectively use those products in different situations. I would say another aspect, just as a reminder, uh, and we'll talk about this as I talk about my research. One thing that you'll see is that gypsum played very little effect in in our case uh, we deal with a much much more of a high salinity issue than we do a sodium issue and and that really changed the uh, benefit that we saw with either gypsum or gypsum like products okay so we had some other products from uh, from some different companies that were more uh, they're gypsum based, same kind of uh, principles, same kind of elements. They were formulated in a way to where they were much released much more quickly. Uh, the idea being that you would get much more activity much more rapidly. And that also may play a role too in some of the timings of irrigation and, and when you might see some benefits and so on and so forth. Uh, the question related to uh, dormant applications on uh, Bermuda grass area. Uh, my feeling is I still would want to irrigate that application. All the things that we worked with ourselves were granular applications of products that you would apply basically like a fertility application, uh, granular fertilizer application. So as far as application technique, I would say that would be the main way that we applied all of our treatments. And then we would want to water that in after application just to make sure that the elements contained on that granular application are dissolved and moved down into the soil so dormant or non-dormant i would still recommend the importance of watering in the product as long as you can if you're in a situation where you can't water for some reason uh, on dormant turf then i would say to try if you can uh, to maybe schedule an application in proximity to a, a rain event, if that's possible, because that may be beneficial to get the product into the soil. Okay, there, there is another question that uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to convert myself to present in order that you can read the okay. question. Yes, it's, okay. it's a long question. Okay. So just, just a second. Okay. Uh... Okay. okay, you can see my 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 screen. Yeah. Just just a second. I don't know why we cannot see uh, here. Is it in the Word document or is it? Yeah, it's a, it's a Word document. Okay. Just a, just a second. Okay. I saw the A word document, but it might be a different word document. Oh, okay. Now I can see this. Okay, so the 10% okay. figure. Yes, this one. Okay. If you, if you want, you can read it whenever. Yeah. So, uh, Okay, so yeah, and uh, I again, I, I took a little piece of a figure out of the textbook that I had uh, mentioned, and there there definitely are some uh, some further explanation in that textbook about ideas related to uh, some of these conductivity 
measurements. So I agree with this uh, participant's uh, point that some of those things, uh, I, I may should have done a little better job clarifying some of those aspects related to when we get really high uh, levels of total dissolved solids and salts in water, it can uh, provide some erroneous measurements and there are some uh, additional calculations that may need to be made to uh, kind of clarify or determine the significance of the salinity issue. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, let me compare it to again. Okay. It's funny because uh, before we, when we were talking about a bit before starting this webinar, yep. we were talking that usually there were not there there not where there were not many, <laughs> many questions. questions, huh? <laughs> That's okay. That's and good. Today, I enjoy the questions. That's I'm different. sorry, but, but it's, it's okay. I like this. I like it too. Uh, so um, okay. let's so, talk a little again. Here we're trying to get into uh, ideas related to uh, kind of application, uh, uh, practical application of work that we did. So uh, we submitted a proposal to the USGA and GCSA that was funded. And it was based on some previous work that we did uh, with a colleague of mine where we collected soil samples at different golf courses here around Lubbock. And what we ended up seeing basically in areas that were quote unquote managed, okay? And they were also irrigated uh, compared to non-managed and non-irrigated areas. We saw increased levels of EC, salt content, exchangeable sodium percentage and sodium absorption ratio at three different depths in the soil. And so this kind of really started to help us recognize that uh, this was an issue and that, you know, we needed to understand a little bit more about how golf courses could overcome uh, some of these salinity issues that are listed here. Now, I will tell you that we collected these samples in 2013 and this paper was ultimately published in 2015. But at the time, this part of Texas had been in a drought for uh, about three years, three complete years, 2011, 2012, and then 2013, in which, you know, typical rainfall is 20 inches. The first year, I believe the whole state of Texas probably got between three and five inches. That may be consistent with what the rainfall is for some of you in some of your areas, but it's not consistent for this area. And so that drought likely continued to separate these areas and created a lot more difference than what we were able to really uh, see in our research because we had kind of started getting back into a normal rainfall pattern. We got a lot more leaching from our work. So the the problems that we felt like we we wanted to address were issues related to uh, climate projections. So if we look at climate projections, especially for semi-arid climates around the world, uh, the expectation is that droughts, drought is going to become more consistent. It's gonna happen more frequently. And that generally it's gonna also be worse. Like they're gonna last longer basically. So more consistency and they're going to last longer. Those are really big implications on turf grass areas where water conservation is a key aspect to what we are trying to promote definitely throughout the United States. And I would assume around the world, uh, golf courses are under pressure to try and utilize less water, but not sacrifice the, uh, the visual characteristics of the golf course, not sacrifice uh, the playability of the golf course, more importantly. So we were kind of asking uh, the research questions of, is there a method that's suitable uh, for all golf courses to maybe utilize uh, ideas of cultivation practices and or commercial products that could be applied without having to apply that leaching fraction of water? Okay, so that was kind of the real big caveat with our research is that we were trying to 
utilize these products, utilize cultivation practices without applying the leaching fraction. And that was our mechanism to try to conserve water in an area of Texas where, you know, water conservation is, is a really big part of what we need to be doing. So we had two different golf courses. We had an 18 and a 36 hole golf course. The 18 hole was, you know, a relatively like medium budget, medium to high budget golf course, plenty of money available uh, to really kind of conduct all of the uh, work and to do different things. Uh, I had TIFF Sport hybrid Bermuda grass on the whole entire golf course that we were working on. It was about 14 years old. Okay, so it was a little bit of a newer construction compared to the second golf course. It was 80 years old. That plays a big role in soil characteristics and different things uh, over time as organic matter is building up. Uh, but the, the other course, 36 holes, lower budget facility doesn't have really the the capability of doing all the same kind of cultivation practices or different things that may be warranted to reduce uh, salt issues in the soils. Um, they also had just common Bermuda grass instead of a hybrid Bermuda grass in that location. So this table uh, just kind of gives you some indication on difference in water quality uh, that we saw at the two different golf courses. The Rawls course is the younger golf course uh, that TIFF Sport Bermuda grass, the Meadowbrook golf course is lower budget, 36 hole facility. You can see some differences here. Um, I think a few things I would point out EC wise, uh, I went back and kind of looked at that Madrid, Spain paper using the reclaimed or recycled water. Uh, our salt content here is measuring a little bit higher than what was at least in that Madrid paper uh, on, you know, about two times higher than some of those in, that were using recycled, reclaimed water. Uh, we generally get pretty high bicarbonates, uh, but yet our SAR, sodium absorption ratio, tends to be relatively minor, low. Uh, so this is what kind of gives us an indication that sodium is not really gonna be our big issue. Uh, we have an issue with salts that can build up in the soil as we get high evapotranspiration rates, but uh, we tend to not really see issues with sodium and that's gonna be influential when we start looking at the results of what we did. Uh, we have high sodium levels, but it's being offset by really high magnesium and uh, calcium in a lot of cases. And that's what kind of offsets those things in our water resources. And I would say based on reading that paper from Madrid, that similar evidence there that uh, sodium absorption ratio, sodium problems were not the big concern, but there was a bigger concern with elevated levels of salts um, for those different plant materials that were being studied in that park. So this kind of uh, walks you through some of our different treatments. We were looking at some different cultivation practices uh, and you can kind of see these in the images here. This is a core air fire uh, where we probably went down about a two to two and a half, three inch uh, depth uh, core. Uh, we had uh, half inch tines, which would convert to about 1.3 millimeter uh, tines that were on, uh, I think a two inch spacing. So that'd be about five centimeters uh, in both directions. It was a pretty tight spacing and uh, a big core. So we were really affecting about, I think about 11 to or so percent of the surface area with that core airification. Uh, a second procedure that we did, you can see in this bottom picture here, was, a, was what we, call, we called a uh, kind of a spiking. Uh, we used a, uh, uh, let's see, what was the name of that product, that thing that we used? Uh, uh, it was basically just a, a spiker. You could go down a fairway very rapidly and basically, you know, get a little bit of an indention, a slicing into the soil uh, to increase some air and water moving channels uh, without having to take the time to clean up cores and do the different things that we know are necessary to undergo core airification on a golf course area. Now, this, this little table here, I want to 
take a little bit of time to look at some of this, but this is our soil texture at the two different golf courses. I apologize, this is golf course A is the Rawls course. Golf course B is Meadowbrook. So, you know, 18 hole, 36 hole facility. Now you can see that there's a slightly higher clay content at uh, the Rawls course compared to what we saw at Meadowbrook. Uh, only by about, you know, four and a half percent, uh, but that also kind of adjusted our uh, soil texture based on the USDA soil textural triangle. And these soil textures are comparable to what were identified in that paper from Madrid, Spain. Uh, so I'm sure each of you are very familiar with the soil textures that you're working on. But this idea of soil texture is going to come back to be important as we look at our results again. OK, so I kind of missed some ideas here in this table. Uh, I think some of my headers were, were white and didn't get transferred over to black. So I can work on that. Uh, to make sure that you guys that have uh, these, this information, you will have knowledge of what each of these treatments are. This is a commercial uh, name for the different products that we applied. Uh, the rate in either kilograms or liters per hectare for dry or liquid products. Application timing or frequency, how frequent were we applying those? Most were monthly. Uh, some were every two weeks, uh, but most were monthly. And then this kind of a description of the product type. Uh, surfactants, uh, about the same as a wetting agent. Uh, we have granular uh, gypsum-based products. And you can see there's a couple of different ones from a, a standard Kelly's gypsum. Vertical G is from AquaAid, uh, as long with, as, along with ORS uh, PS. Uh, and then a DG gypsum from Anderson's. Uh, fertilizer company in the turf market. And then this was a liquid calcium product that was applied. So you can kind of just kind of get an idea of what the different products that were applied and frequencies and timings. So uh, again, we didn't have quite the results, uh, outstanding results that we were maybe hoping for when we got this started, partly because we did start to see a lot more rainfall and rainfall was a big part of driving and leaching salts down through the the canopy of the turf grass but what we generally saw when we look at uh, soil electrical conductivity here uh, these measurements we were seeing an increase in salinity uh, whenever we were looking at our gypsum based products again not terribly a surprise when we thought about it in the end because we're basically adding a salt to the soil through our gypsum applications in doing so, we were really increasing the salinity level with those different granular products. Okay, our surfactants and other liquid products kind of maintained an EC that were statistically signif significantly lower uh, than what we saw with those gypsum based products. However, it wasn't all bad news for those granular products because at the end of our two year study, uh, you can see here that we actually created a significant reduction in soil pH when we looked at those same granular products. So we were increasing the soil EC measured, but we decreased soil pH. It took two years for this to really ever become different. Uh, two years of us applying monthly applications during the growing season. So we were applying uh, product probably in May, June, and July, maybe August, uh, but probably about three to four applications of products on a monthly time frame for most of those, again, based on the frequency in that table that we looked at previously. So although we saw the higher EC level, we did see a decrease in soil pH, which may uh, help things like nutrient availability, especially with the micronutrients, where we tend to see uh, deficiencies in those high soil pH um, situations. And then the other big thing that we saw uh, recognize, this is where the soil texture kind of comes back into play, is recovery from our aerification practices. And so the Rawls course with that slightly higher clay content really seemed to slow recovery from our aerification procedures. And this measurement here is a ratio 
ratio vegetation index. Uh, it's kind of like an NDVI measure, uh, but used a little bit more frequently when we do turf grass research, we get full cover of turf grass. Uh, in comparison to NDVI, that's a little bit more frequently used in our agricultural uh, settings where we get plant soil, plant soil uh, combinations. NDVI does better in that case. RVI does better in our turf grass situation. So uh, Raw's course at the top here, the top bars, top grass, you can see there's a lot of difference with aerification being significantly lower than the other cultivation treatments. Now, in contrast to that, when we look at the bottom grass from Meadowbrook, there's a little bit more sand content, more organic matter there. Uh, it's an older golf course. Uh, after we recovered from that initial injury, uh, you can see that the aerification and the cultivated overall sliced or aerified really had improved RVI compared to the untreated. So that's kind of an indication of with maybe that either older golf course or higher sand content, we're seeing a greater benefit from those cultivation practices, extended root growth potentially, uh, just better overall growing conditions. It recovered more quickly and really improved after it recovered from the cultivation practices. So I will uh, kind of finish things up here and, and conclude uh, just some overall conclusions from the research that we conducted. Uh, one being that uh, EC, electrical conductivity, salt content in that soil, uh, we, we only measured the top 10 centimeters, uh, really fluctuated a lot with rainfall events and ET. So if we collected soil after a rainfall event, we had a low number. If we collected soil way far out, there was a lot of irrigation being provided, the EC level really started to increase. Um, however, um, I would say that we never saw any indication of stress on Bermuda grass at either location. So highest levels that we reached in the soil, we never really accumulated enough to see evidence of actual problems on that Bermuda grass. Keep in mind that Bermuda grass is highly tolerant to salts. So that may be part of the reason that we didn't see any issues there. The gypsum applications, again, granular gypsum for us and all those different cultivation practices really didn't do a whole lot for us beneficially. We were not dealing with a sodium issue. We were dealing with a salt issue. And so we ended up really increasing the salt levels in that upper portion of the soil with gypsum. But after two years of application, we did reduce the soil pH, which may be very beneficial when we're thinking about nutrient availability to our plant. The high clay content uh, in that one golf course really appeared to slow down recovery uh, from our aerification procedures specifically. So in that case, there may be some benefit to uh, using some different practices that are not affecting such a large surface area to reduce some of the uh, recovery situations that we may expect or want to see, maybe smaller tines, uh, maybe the slicing really didn't seem to have as big of an issue as what we saw with core aerification in, in that case. We also did not top dress back, so all we did was create the channels, remove the cores, let it grow back in. So that may have also been uh, part of the reason that we continue to see uh, evidence of our aerification practices well into the summer and even into the fall as that grass was preparing to go into dormancy. And then lastly, uh, benefit from cultivation practices at the second golf course where we had a higher sand content, a little bit older golf course with higher organic matter content. We did see benefits from both cultivation practices when we measured the health of that turf grass. Okay, so that was a, a slight visual improvement, but also just an overall healthier canopy uh, with a uh, difference again in soil texture, probably being the biggest thing differentiating those two different golf courses in those cases. So uh, that was what I had put together to present. And I'm, I'm very thankful that we had some questions during the presentation. Uh, if there are further questions that have come up, uh, then I would be happy to address those at this time. Um, thank you very much. 
Uh, yes, there is there is another uh, another question. Okay. Uh, from Michael, uh, like the one before. So let me convert myself to present. Oh, okay, it. awesome. Yeah. Because it, it's a long question. Okay. Just a second. You know, if if people happen to need to be jumping off, to I would uh, just uh, let everyone know my appreciation for. Uh, your time. I know this is a, a crazy time for everyone around the world uh, dealing with this pandemic that we're all uh, working through. So thoughts and prayers for all those who may be affected directly or indirectly by this uh, really horrible situation. But uh, I appreciated the time of being able to come and visit with everyone today. Okay, and we appreciate your time and your collaboration. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, okay, uh, you can see this table. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 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 the question and the question is that is the, 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 at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. What is the, and you do not see a difference in ET uh, reduced plots related to the leached ones. Uh, so the question uh, at uh, is is in regards to leaching versus not leaching. Let's let do something. Uh, I'm gonna uh, unmute. Okay. Uh, and that's the, I think that would be the key to to manage properly. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's say uh, hi, Michael. Hello. Hello. I think. Hello, thank you very much for your question. Okay. Uh, okay, we are all listening to you, so all yours. Thank you. No, well, you have you have another question mixed. Uh, the 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 cosa abajo de yeah, no saying this this one, uh, Doctor Joseph. This is a each each cation and anion has their own coefficients to determine what kind of conductivity they give to the water per okay. milliequivalent. That's okay. what I was saying before in the question. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then another one was I was saying is I know uh, I forget who the brothers are out there in California way with all the gypsum and the vertical, but it, gypsum doesn't reduce the pH. It's, it's neutral. And the rainfall, okay. the rainfall can reduce pH. OK. <laughs> you had okay. drought and then you went into rainfall. Right. In Ireland, the, the pH of the soil is 5.5 and in Spain, it's 8.3 because yeah. it doesn't rain. The more it rains in Ohio or, yeah. you know, the way that I, the way that Brookside Laboratory does their analysis, and many times the the analysis over here that that lacking calcium and magnesium, they've been sent to either MD Harris or or Brookside, and by the time they get over there, the calcium and, and magnesium has been precipitated a bit, and that's why the cation and anion equal equation gets thrown off. That's okay. what I okay yeah. okay that's reasonable. I I would say is within relation to uh, the acidifying effect of gypsum in our research. Uh, we did all of the studies, all of the EC and pH measurements ourselves. So that wasn't a laboratory produced value. And it's a, just a comparison of the treatments that we were applying. So they were, soil samples were collected from all the different treatments. We had three replications of each treatment combination. And so that's where we kind of came up with the idea and the conclusion that the gypsum in our case was reducing soil pH versus other products that had a higher soil pH. Uh -huh. Maybe it's reacting with the rain or no? Yeah, I, I, well, the thing is that it would have all gotten basically the same rain. The I mean, same, it was yeah. uh, within probably, a, I don't know how to really convert this to another number, but I mean, our, our total study area at each golf course was a, a thousand square feet maybe so uh -huh. i don't think there would have been that much variation in the rainfall one to the other we had it replicated there were different uh strips of treatments being applied so the opportunity for there to be different rainfall there could have been different infiltration rates at of rainfall in different portions of the experiment but it was replicated and set up in a way to where I think we would feel really confident that the variation that we see in soil pH at the end of our trial was, you know, really ineffective that gypsum being applied. 
and reducing the soil pH. Okay, thank you for that. But okay, I do agree you. with you about variations around the world. Uh, a lot of that is driven by uh, rainfall. So I do agree with that point that you brought up. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Michael. I'm sorry because that that was not your question. I I confused the question with with, with that was another question from another I, job manager. Sorry, I Michael. Scroll down. That's no, okay. I can't scroll down to it. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Uh, so I think there is there is another. No, there are no more no more questions. So, and it's we are running. Yeah, sorry, we went a little hour long. and a half. So, Good discussion, though. So. <laughs> okay, so th thank you, thank you very much again, Dr. Young, for your for your collaboration, and, and and it was great to 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 have you here with Campus of Tespet. Yes, sir. It was uh, it was like I said, it was a real honor, and I appreciate all of you who uh, took time out of your day to be part of this. Thank you very much. Okay, you guys have a great one. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye. Bueno, pues nada, pues uh, a agradeceros. La verdad es que hoy ha sido un webinar que, pues bueno, lo hemos, lo hemos disfrutado porque ah, cuando hay preguntas, pues ya veis que la interacción es, es más que positiva. Uh, pues nada, uh, nos despedimos de todos del próximo webinar. Veremos a ver cuándo lo programamos porque. La situación está un poquito complicada, o sea que ya os informaremos de, de, la, de, la, de, la, de la fecha del próximo evento. Eh, muchas gracias a todos y hasta la próxima. Ok, Joseph, bye bye. Ok, see Thank ya. Have a good one. Thank you. Be safe. You too. Bye.